Thank you very much for that kind introduction, and I appreciate very much this opportunity to come out and talk to you today. I appreciate you coming out and, and listening to my talk. It's my first time uh, at Iowa State, and, and I already have very fond memories. You've treated me extremely well, so thank you very much. Um, so my talk today uh, relates to what I've been working on for a number of years, and that is using kinematic redundancy to design fault-tolerant systems. So uh, I thought first thing I should do is probably define some of those terms, right? Because uh, many people maybe not be familiar. I'm sure you're not familiar. There's no reason that you should. Uh, first of all, in terms of robotic systems, uh, I talk about robotics a lot, and I do work in robotics, but really it's much more general. We're talking about the motion control of articulated systems or any sort of jointed system. So you do have these traditional robots, uh, uh, for example, these robots that are used for small mechanical or electrical assembly, robots that may be used for our arc welding or spray painting or that. But you can also think of things like forestry equipment. So these are jointed uh, m machines that are used to cut down trees and to trim trees. Uh, you may think of, um, you know, a uh, earth moving equipment, right? So you have m multiple joints that you're going to be controlling. Or you can talk about the new uh, surgical robots, such as the Da Vinci robot that's being used a lot these days for laparoscopic surgery. So all of these cases, you have multiple actuators. You have multiple joints that are trying to control some sort of a tool, right? And the concern is for controlling uh, the six dimensional motion, usually, of whatever tool you're using for whatever application may be of interest. Right? So those are the sorts of systems that I'm talking about, not just sort of your traditional uh, robotic systems. So then the next part of my title talks about kinematic redundancy. Right? What does that mean? Right, the general concept of needing redundancy in order to be fault tolerant, I think a lot of people are familiar with that, and it's applicable in a lot of different areas. But if you're talking about kinematic redundancy, it's something very specific. It's about the motion that's required to successfully perform the task that you're interested in. So for example, if you're interested in a simple planar positioning task, let's say you're looking at objects maybe that are circular, so you don't care about their orientation, and all that matters is sort of where you place them in the plane. So you can model that as saying, I need to put that point somewhere in this xy plane. To be able to do that with a, with a machine that you're controlling joints, you only need two joints. Right? So the dimension of your controllable joints, of right, your, your actuators in your machine, uh, ma it should match that of the task. If it does, that's called kinematically sufficient mechanism. So two joints, if all you care about is positioning in the plane. If you have objects that need to be oriented in the plane, Right? So it matters, right? not just this position, but what orientation, if you want to grasp something in the plane or insert something, then you need three joints in to be able to arbitrarily position and orient. Right? If all you care about is three-dimensional positioning, you still need three joints, right? but there has to be a different sort of kinematic arrangement. In this case, you have three joints that are all collinear, right? so they all have motion only in the plane. If you're looking at positioning in three space, three dimensional degrees of freedom, but those three joints now cannot be collinear, right? So the axes have to be offset in order to get three dimensional motion at this point. And then of course the, the most general uh, motion would be moving in three dimensions, and of course that's a six dimensional problem because we care not only about the three dimensional position, but also about the three dimensional orientation in space. So to be able to position and orient, six joints. So a robot that has the minimum number of joints to, to perform the motion required for the task is called kinematically sufficient. Those that have more than six joints or more than the minimum required would be called redundant, kinematically redundant. Okay. Um, and there's a lot of examples of kinematically redundant robots. In fact, anything that's human-like is going to be uh, kinematically redundant, and most biological mechanisms are human drive. So anthropomorphic arms, my arm, your arm, has seven degrees of freedom. If you're talking about just uh, positioning sort of the location of your hand, you have three joints in your wrist, three independent degrees of freedom. You have a joint in your elbow, that's four, and you have three independent joints in your shoulder, right? so you have seven. So anything that's human-like. Uh, dual arm manipulation, if you're talking about the relative motion between two arms, even if you had two kinematically sufficient arms, both had six degrees of freedom, the relative motion uh, between them would be uh, kinematically redundant. Okay? So 
Um, so these are the kind of robots that, you know, are, are classic kinematically redundant ones. This is Asimo from Honda. There's a lot of humanoid robotics research being done, uh, a lot of it being done in Japan. This you may have seen uh, on 60 Minutes. I think maybe a year or two ago, Rodney Brooks from I Think Robotics showed uh, Baxter. This is Baxter. Uh, two seven degree of freedom arms and meant to work in cooperation with people. Right? And if you look at a lot of the uh, advanced manufacturing uh, initiatives in the National Robotics Initiative that Professor, uh, President Obama talked about, a lot of it is about cooperation, cooperation of robots with people. So you see a lot of that. If you want to get extreme right, in terms of kinematic redundancy, uh, you can talk about something like hyper-redundant robots, extremely redundant. And these are things like snakes, or if you throw them into the water, they're eels. They have a lot of different joints. Right? Uh, these are some of the snake robots from Howie Choset's lab at Carnegie Mellon. Um, and these, uh, uh, these are sometimes also called continuum robots because you have uh, almost approximating a the ability to continuously uh, sort of have the, the sh different shapes of the robot. So these are the kind of kinematically, uh, this is the definition of kinematic redundancy and examples of some kinematically redundant uh, robots. So now, well, what do I do with these, right? There's lots of different problems in robotics. There's, you know, building actuators, there's building sensing, there's doing planning, all different types of levels of control. My work is in motion planning at sort of a, sort of a high level control. It's not individual controls of the motors. I'm assuming that there's going to be some sort of a controller there that if I give it a reasonable motion that's physically realizable, it will be able to do that motion. But what I'm concerned with is if I want a high-level task, right? So if in a factory, I want to say uh, arc weld that seam or spray paint that car door, right? Or in a medical application, okay, perform this type of a surgery, high-level descriptions, how do you co coordinate all of those many degrees of freedom to get those tasks done? How do you get that motion done? So it's automatic coordination of the motion for all your controllable actuators to achieve a high-level description of a task. Okay, so what goes into that? Well, uh, there's algorithms or software. Uh, you'd like to optimize what you're doing. It's not just, okay, some paths, so there's some set of coordinations that will do this. Let's do it in some optimal way. Right, so this is what human beings do. If you look at athletes in particular, right, you look at people that do weightlifting, right, it's not just lifting that weight, having a particular trajectory for it. They optimize it in order to be able to lift as much weight as possible. There's a specific trajectory, a specific coordination of all their joints right, that gives them additional uh, abilities, right, additional dexterity. Right? Um, Kinematic singularities, this is a little bit uh, sort of a, maybe an esoteric topic, but it turns out that uh, human beings and, and any sort of jointed mechanism, um, if you take dexterity sort of to its extreme, extremal abilities are, are either uh, uh, exhibited at, at lo certain locations, certain configurations that are called kinematic singularities, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But then there's also stuff that's uh, taken for granted by human beings, right? If I tell you to go, uh, go outside and do something, you know to go through the door, right? Not to try to go through the wall, right? You're not going to run into things. So we'd like to have our software not just do the task that you want to do, but do it in an intelligent way, or, or at least not in a, in a, in a non-intelligent way, right? So obstacle avoidance is important. And then I'll talk a little bit specifically about fault tolerance. How do you do motion coordination to remain, uh, remain uh, tolerant to possible failures that may occur. Right? So one ex you know, typical example of, again, what does all of this mean? I, I like to show this as, as sort of an exemplar. Right? Uh, let's say I say, robot spray paint that car door. What information do you need to include into a motion planning algorithm? Well, you need information about the robot that's doing this, right? information about yourself. How do I move? How many joints do I have? What's the shapes of those joints? How are they related to each other in this string of joints right, that are going to be performing the motion? So you need that sort of information. You need information about the task that you're doing. So if I say spray paint that car door, it'd be nice if I had a CAD model right, that gives me the physical geometry of that car door so that I know where things are, what the surface normals are, and how I need to do uh, that motion. 
You'd also like to know information about the task that you're doing in terms of, well, what are the velocity constraints in terms of how these spray coatings have to be go, uh, laid down? Right? How fast do you need to go to get the right depth? Um, what sort of acceleration constraints are there so that you don't spend too much time somewhere or, or the paint uh, drips? Right? So you'd like to be able to automatically generate that path based on the, on the constraints of the task and then translate that into motion of the joints in some way that's optimal and includes things like collision detection. So if I say spray paint the back door, right, you know to go through the opening in the window rather than uh, going through the metal of the door itself. So ultimately you'd like to be able to say, oh, okay, um, my command is just spray paint and you click and it does it. It knows to lay down that path as it's going back and forth. You can see it coordinates so it doesn't hit itself. When it prepares to go through the car door, it sort of moves up and makes sure that it takes care of all that. Right? So uh, this is the goal. Right? This is what, the way we'd like to be able to deal with robots. We're not there yet. Right? We're still, we have pieces of all of this, but it's not at this high of, of a level. Right now, if you went to a factory, which you'd probably see if you're asking a, uh, someone to spray paint a car door is, initially a human being would be using a physical spray gun and you would be mimicking those motions from a human being. Right? But this is our goal. All right, so with that context, uh, let's talk a little bit about how do we go about defining the mathematics of kinematic redundancy how do we define dexterity for robots so that we have some set of measures to say, okay, how do I define fault tolerance as sort of maintaining some level of dexterity that's required for a task? Okay, so that's what our, I'll be talking about next. And again, I'm going to use the simplest example because it's, it has a lot of geometric intu uh, intuition. Let's say that our task is just planar positioning of some tool or some end effector. This is how I'm going to affect my environment. I have a tool here, and all I care about is the three-dimensional position of that tool to perform the task. So it's a two degree of freedom task uh, in the plane, but I have three joints. So I'm kinematically redundant by one degree of freedom. Right? So if you're concerned with saying, okay, I'd like to know where my tool is in the plane, that's a simple problem. It's a simple uh, trigonometry problem. I look at the encoders that are on these joints. I read the joint angles off of those encoders. So I have these three values. I know the link lengths. And so I can do, uh, you know, the uh, cosine of this angle times this length gives me this distance, this distance, this distance, and I can tell you where I'm at. So the forward kinematics problem of telling me where is my tool by reading the encoders, the sensors on the joints, is easy. But that's not the problem we're trying to solve. Right? We'd like to say, put that tool somewhere, or in general, move that tool in a particular path, and tell me what control signals I need to send to those joints. Okay? So now you have a coupled set of nonlinear equations, highly nonlinear. Right? Solutions to those equations may exist. There may be no solutions if you tell me to go somewhere outside the physical reach of the robot. There may be one solution if you tell me to go here and it's completely stretched out. If I go inside of here, there's infinite set of solutions, but I don't know if there's a, continue, a single continuous set of infinite solutions or if there's two infinities of solutions that are not connected. So it's not a trivial problem at the position level. So for multiple reasons, one of them being that uh, non-triviality of, of looking at the solutions, um, is what we'll do is we'll look at the velocity of that tool point rather than its position. And we'll look at the two-dimensional velocity of that point relative to the velocity of these three joints. That problem turns out to be linear. So the velocity that you get that's sort of built up from the rotations of these three joints linearly combines to give you a velocity at the tooltip, and that's through this matrix uh, called the Jacobian matrix. Okay? So that's the problem that we're looking at. Now the Jacobian, um, you know, from its uh, mathematical definition, lots of people use Jacobians, it's the partial derivatives, right, of the input, output relative to the input. Yes, that's all true, but in this case there's a much better physical geometric interpretation of the Jacobian. Rather than thinking of it as partial derivatives, I think of it as a transformation from our input space that we're controlling. 
Right? So the joint velocity that I command my motors for motor one, two, and three, right, that's some point in this space, gets transformed into a tooltip velocity over here. That transformation is represented by this Jacobian matrix, and the columns are very special because the columns are essentially, first column tells you what is the contribution of the motor one to the partial velocity at the tooltip. And what's the contribution of motor two? What's the contribution of motor three? And you can compute these rather than doing partial derivatives from very simple geometry. You can say, if I'm rotating joint one at a particular velocity, the velocity that I get at my tooltip due to that will be proportional to this distance and perpendicular to that vector. So just like anything rotating around, right, the velocity at the end of a CD or a DVD right, is a function of how quickly you're rotating it and how far out you are, right, its radius. So you have three rotating disks that give you three different sets, and, the, and you add these all up to get your final joint velocity. Right? So that's a, a nice uh, interpretation of what each individual joint will do for you. Now, if you're trying to characterize the entire capability of this robot, its kinematic capability, right, how much dexterity it has uh, in terms of this transformation, it's nice to look at these in terms of columns, uh, looking at the individual contribution, but if you want to look at all of it, you sort of need to figure out with all the different ways that I could uh, choose to send velocities to these joints, what's the total capability of the robot? So an interpretation of that is if I look at all the possible velocities that I can control inside, and if I say, let's put some physical limit around the total that I tell it to do. Right? In other words, let's put a limit on the uh, norm of the joint velocity. That would mean that I am, uh, if it was a two-norm, Euclidean norm, I'd have to be somewhere within this sphere in this space. And so then how does that sphere of inputs to the joints relate to tooltip velocity. So, of course, this is a linear transformation, right, because it's a you know, Jacobi matrix, it's linear. A sphere is going to be transformed into an ellipse over here. And uh, what does this ellipse tell us physically? It says that, well, certain motions for a given sized input, Right, so for a given velocity to those joints, even though I'm distributing it differently among the different joints, but it's fixed in total amount, there are certain directions that are easier to move. I'll get a bigger velocity out of the tooltip of my robot. And there's other directions that are uh, more difficult to move. Right? Human beings know this uh, automatically. Right? So if you think about a tennis player right, trying to get maximum velocity out of their racket, right? They sort of get a particular configuration and they, and they move in a particular direction so that they're the limit of what they can do in terms of the joint velocity that they can achieve at their arms maximizes the output velocity of the tool that they have. Okay? So this is useful information for defining dexterity. How much can you magnify a fixed amount of input right, in the maximum direction? In what direction is that, right, the easy direction to move, and what are the directions that are difficult to move in? Okay. So what I've given you is a very physically meaningful geometric interpretation of what is very well known by mathematicians, is that you can take any matrix, uh, decompose it into the product of three matrices, right, the singular value decomposition, well, uh, these two matrices are orthogonal, which means they represent coordinate frames. This matrix is diagonal, which means it represents scaling. Well, the scale factors of this diagonal matrix are how easy is it to move in the easy direction and how difficult is it to move in the difficult direction. The singular vectors associated with this are the direction in which it's easy to move and the direction in which it's difficult to move. And the new coordinate frame in your input space says, if you want to move in this easy to move direction or maximum scaling of velocity, you should apply exactly this combination of joint velocities to your motors and you'll get that motion. Okay. So a lot of very useful information about the dexterity of this machine, uh, this robot, in terms of the singular value decomposition <coughs> of the Jacobian. 
So motivated by this, you might say, okay, easy to move, difficult to move, how bad can it get? If I move my robot around, it's got different, different uh, configurations, it has different Jacobians. If I do this and I look at the scaling here, how bad can it get? Well, bad news is it can get pretty bad. In fact, it can go all the way to zero. And this shouldn't surprise you in the sense that if you think about a robot arm, the effect of, the, of rotating here and the effect of rotating here, as I start to line these things up, the effect that my tooltip starts to become linearly dependent. They both give me the same motion. So it becomes easy to move in that motion, but it becomes difficult to move in this motion. All right. And again, if you think about it a little bit, that's not surprising because ultimately I can't move over here. I can't get to this point regardless of what configuration I put my robot in. So at some point I have to transition from being able to move in this direction to not being able to. It has to go to zero. So the boundaries of your workspace can be defined actually by this minimum singular value and these kinematic singularities. So this is a good measure. This measure of the smallest singular value of the Jacobian is a common measure of dexterity that tells you what's the worst case uh, in terms of being able to move in a particular direction. And if you look at the vector associated with it, it will tell you which direction that is. Okay? So that's the bad news about kinematic singularities. Uh, but there's good news, right? It's engineering. There's always a flip side, right? Good news, bad news, trade-offs. Okay? So a lot of people say kinematic singularity is bad. A lot of control software for kinematic, you know, and for robots says, don't go in those configurations, right? They're bad. You lose the ability to move in a particular direction. My answer to that is, is when I'm standing here, I don't stand like this, <laughs> right? I stand like this with my joints straight up and down at a kinematic singularity of my legs. Why do I do that? Well, it's because even though the velocity is, is governed by this Jacobian equation that tells you the relationship of the velocities to the, to the, uh, of the joints to the, to the uh, tooltip, the same Jacobian, but it's transpose, tells you the relationship of the torques at your joints to the static force that you can uh, maintain at your tooltip. So directions that are difficult to move in are actually very good at balancing static forces. So I stand like this, right, at a kinematic singularity because the force of the, my center of gravity is straight down through my legs using no torque at my joints. It's being balanced by the links, right, by my bones. Same thing if you're trying to push somebody against the door. Right? You're not going to try pushing this way. You've got your arms locked because it's, you, you can balance a static force much better uh, along this singular direction. Hmm? So um, bottom line is uh, your motion planning algorithm shouldn't avoid these configurations. You should take advantage of them. You should understand what's happening and take advantage of it for the task at hand. So yes. You do lose an independent degree of motion. There will be some direction that you can't move in. But if your task doesn't require that direction of motion, so what? Right. Um, problem, high joint velocity near there. If you're near one of these, you may still be able to move in that direction, but it takes a lot of joint motion to get you a little bit of tool motion. So that can be a problem. Right. Can you generate that high velocity, or that, does that high velocity cause some problems with you, for you? Um, this problem is singularities are configuration uh, dependent, which means it depends on how the robot is structured, not where you are in your workspace. So there's no way to say, well, just don't go here. This is the space you need to avoid. No, it depends on how you go there that determines whether you're singular or not, the configuration of your arm. And there's no way to uh, uh, generate a the new design of robot that avoids this. Any robot that has rotary joints will have kinematic singularities. And this is a topological argument because rotary joints sort of live in circular space. Right? You take two circles together, you get a torus. Right? When you do the transformation to workspace, you're squishing that torus into a Euclidean space. And that topological difference is what gives you kinematic singularities. So it's impossible to design a ro rotary uh, mechanism without them. Positive side is um, 
higher static force capability, right? The fact that you can use that uh, direction that's, that's difficult to move in for forces, balancing forces. Uh, small motion in one direction frequently means bigger motion in another direction, right? Another one. And higher ac accuracy with respect to uh, the discretization of the, or the sensors on your joints. So you get higher accuracy. So those are all positive things. Um, and this is sort of a, just a way of dealing with the high joint velocity. It's just th throwing some equations here. Uh, if you're familiar with uh, you know, SVD, lots of times it's used for using pseudo-inverse or solving uh, equations. Uh, uh, you've seen a lot of this is done in the kinematics, uh, kinematic, kinematically redundant literature. I would caution you not to do this. <laughs> right? uh, do a damply squares formulation instead, where you combine uh, uh, trajectory tracking of your tooltip along with the norm of the velocity required to generate that trajectory tracking. All right, so you do a uh, combined optimization there. All right, but let's give you a specific example of how this works. Uh, traditional robot design, this is a six degree of freedom uh, robot called the Puma. It's been around forever. It rotates here around what it's called its, uh, its waist. It rotates here around what it's called its shoulder, rotates here at the elbow, and then it has a three-dimensional wrist. You have a rotation like this, a rotation straight out of the board, and a rotation here at the tooltip. And even in the way that it's pictured here, it's in a kinematic singularity. It's easy to see because this rotation here uh, at this axis is exactly lined up with this rotation. So you can rotate an object this way with these two joints, you can rotate it this way with these two joints, but there's nothing that allows you to rotate it this way. So you can't get full orientation capability when it's in that configuration. Okay. So what does that mean? Um, if you look at this robot on the right, as it gets up to the top of a circular trajectory, it will be in that configuration that's kinematically singular of the wrist, and you will see the undesirable effects of doing that. So if you saw that, that rotation, that's what would be required if you wanted to exactly trace that motion um, at, through that kinematic singularity. Very high joint velocity of those two joints that are lining up. Let's watch it again. You see that on the left. So that's what a traditional robot controller would tell you to do. Of course, the robot would shut down before it would do that because you would rip up all the cables that were on the inside of that <laughs> robot. Right? On the, on the left, what you see is our uh, control software, and it does virtually exactly the same motion. It's almost indistinguishable, the motion that you're getting, but we're just filtering out that one six-dimensional uh, axis that's, that's required to do that motion that's very difficult for this robot to do. So you can get uh, very low velocity from the uh, joints to do a, virtually the same motion uh, through one of the kinematic singularities. So here's another example, because it's not just wrists. There's another kinematic singularity. If this robot has its wrist directly underneath the base here, there's no combination of joint motion that allows it to move linearly away or towards the base. And so what happens is you'll see a very high acceleration. It'll try to move uh, at its waist very rapidly uh, if you ask it to do any component. So right there, you saw that jerk um, right now. Okay, that's not physically realizable. Uh, the robot on this side doesn't have that. Right? Again, it's simply this numerical filtering of just that component of the motion that's not possible, and it allows you to go through points that uh, previously were unachievable. One final example is the elbow. So just like any robot, if you stretch it completely out, you're at your workspace boundary, there's no way to go uh, further in that direction. So it's a natural kinematic singularity. And uh, this one has it at the end. And robot doesn't split into two, right? <laughs> but what I wanted to show you here is uh, another feature of kinematic singularities. So the solutions to the equations for being somewhere, like let's say I want my tooltip right there, there are actually multiple solutions. So there is a down elbow solution, there's an up elbow solution, uh, and there's also a right shoulder and a left shoulder solution. So I'm showing you a left shoulder up elbow compared to a down, you know, or a left sh right shoulder or down elbow. 
but there's multiple ones of these. And they coalesce at singular points. So if you're moving around and you're tracking, if you say, okay, I'm going to test out my assembly sequence here. Okay, okay, I'm not hitting anything, right? My elbow's not hitting anything. But, and then you let the robot run, and if it goes into a kinematic singularity, it may come out of it in a different solution. And now all the checks you did for obstacle avoidance may be worthless. So that's another important feature of kinematic singularities. Again, downside, but you could use them, right? You can use kinematic singularities to smoothly go from one type of solution to another type of solution. Right. So uh, that's sort of enough background, hopefully, for you to get a feel for um, what are the dexterity issues. So what are the, what's the mathematical machinery and what's sort of the cap ways of being able to identify um, how do you uh, evaluate what a robot's capable of or not capable of, at least from a kinematic point of view. Right? So now I'd like to talk a little bit about redundancy. And so this fundamental problem of, I, I have more joints than I need. Let's say I need the position in three space. I can do it by placing my four joints in this configuration, or this configuration, or this configuration, or in fact an infinite set of them right, throughout this range. Well, which one's the best? How do I decide which one's the best? Um, we use a formulation that basically allows you to break up your solution that you're going to send to your joints into two pieces. Give me the minimum amount of joint motion for the task I need to do, and then add on a piece that's what's called a, a homogeneous solution. It's motion of the joints, this rocking motion back and forth, with zero tooltip velocity. In mathematics terms, this is actually the null vector of your Jacobian transformation. Right? It's positive input, a non-zero input, zero output. This is the physical interpretation, physical meaning of motion along that null vector. So adding amount any of that motion of the null vector, which coincidentally comes from the singular value decomposition, which is another reason for doing that, you can add that on to whatever else you're doing. So you do your task and add on as much of this reconfiguration and internal motion to satisfy other constraints. Okay. Uh, the issue is those, those null vectors are very complicated. So what I'm showing you here is um, if I move this thing all the way out here to the end, that's the only way I can be there, right? There is no null motion. There's one way of being there. There's one solution, zero, zero, zero. If I move in a little bit, there's sort of a range of things I can do. It's a small range. If I start moving in more, there's a bigger and bigger range. Right? So what I did was I plotted that. I moved the robot out here. I plotted it, all of its null motion, then moved it in a little, plotted its null motion, moved it in a little, plotted its null motion. And you get a surface that looks like this. This is a fairly complicated surface. Um, and it's only for the very simplest redundant robot. So. Uh, it's, it's not even a surface, it's a manifold, because it's a surface that gets split apart and broken into two pieces. So if you look at this, probably this is a good view. This is joint space. This is theta 1, theta 2, and theta 3. Right, we're looking down theta 1 axis. That point right there is the arm stretched out. That's the only way you can be there. If I start moving in, I, can, I have a range of possible solutions, which are these ellipses. Then these ellipses starting to get bigger and starting to get twisted. And then you get close enough, this single continuous solution breaks up into two uh, disjoint solutions. And as the tooltip gets all the way into the beginning, what you get is two straight lines. Let's do this. You get that straight line. <laughs> so you get a straight line right there and a straight line right there. That's the robot. Oops. That's the robot having its tooltip right here, where all it does is it can rotate around theta one. It's a straight line around theta one, and it can do that with this up elbow configuration, or it can do it with its down elbow. But you can't get one from one to the other by just rotating around theta one. Right? So that shows you some of the complexity of those null motion surfaces or, or manifolds. But in a practical point of view, you can use them with these formulations. You can say, spray paint the car door, but uh, maximize the minimum distance to any collision with this motion. But keep it without 
affecting this motion. So it's just internal reconfiguration. You won't get this motion exactly, but you will increase this distance. And that's how we did the simulation of the control of the robot spray painting. And uh, you basically want to have zones around obstacles where the closer you get to an obstacle, the more your obstacle avoidance velocity increases until you get to a point where you may say, hey, stop operating because you can't both spray paint and not hit something. Because this works for dynamic obstacles as well, if a human being sort of walked into the uh, uh, spray painting booth. And this was implemented um, for uh, spray coatings on stealth fighter jets. So I worked uh, with Sandia National Laboratory that was looking at laying down um, the uh, uh, coatings on these, on these jets. They have to, that's part of the stealth properties. It's not only the geometry of the, of the uh, wings and everything, but it's the layers, the different layers of coatings that are, are, are very precisely controlled. They use a commercial six degree of freedom robot spray pudding robot arm, but it sits on this huge platform, uh, rotation here, uh, rotation here, and this thing moves up and down about uh, uh, 10 meters high, right? And this thing travels, right, and so that it can uh, move around the aircraft and uh, spray paint the aircraft. So it's a very uh, practical application of this. All right, so uh, in the little time I have left, the main topic is, okay, how do you use this redundancy for fault tolerance? So you have extra motion, you have redundancy within your robot, uh, fault tolerance. Applications, the major application for this, we originally funded this work, was uh, nuclear. So it was the Department of Energy for Nuclear Waste Remediation, cleaning up uh, nuclear junk that was stored in underground storage tanks, you know, 60 years ago. Uh, and then also for some nuclear decommissioning, uh, uh, decommissioning weapons that are past their prime and you have to take them apart and get the plutonium core out. Uh, and you could also do this for space or underwater exploration, anywhere that you can't maintain a robot and that humans can't go in, failures will occur. Question is, what happens afterwards? Right? So uh, failure modes, locked actuators and free swinging actuators. Right? So, Again, we're using this, uh, this null motion. Um, I wanted to just show you this very quickly again to get you into the configuration that I'll show on the next page. All right. So if you look at it from this view, this is us looking down the joint one axis. Uh, this is the theta two, theta three axis. So you have this area where you have, continu you have a continuous solution, big, nice, uh, homogeneous possibilities for internal motion, and then you have these two sides that are sort of two separate pieces. That's what I'm showing you here. And what this does is it allows you to define different points within your workspace that are more fault tolerant. Fault tolerant in the sense that if something fails while I'm at this point, if joint two or three fails, I can look and see that the set of all motions for being at point B is this. So if one of my joints fails, that's like saying, okay, theta two has to be along this line because it failed at this joint. If it intersects this, these curves anywhere, that means there is a solution for being at the point you wanna be at, even if that joint fails. So the size of these self motion curves give you a measure of the fault tolerance. So experiment we did for Sandia. Um, I am decommissioning a nuclear weapon and I need to uh, take out the plutonium core that's at the center of that weapon. They want to know where is the tool rest, where is the disposal site, where should that be? So that if I'm in the process, I've already taken that out of the weapon, while I'm moving, if something fails, if one joint fails, I can guarantee I can still get to that disposal site. So they wanted us to come up with tools that could identify that for different robot structures. So this is an example of this. Uh, this robot's a, a traditional robot. It has five degrees of freedom. So it's not redundant in the classical sense. But if you're talking about 3D positioning of a sphere, that only takes three degrees of freedom. You don't care about the orientation. Right? So there's actually two degrees of freedom um, for um, determining what configuration do you want the robot to be in. And the more configurations you have, the more fault tolerant it is. 
So we did the analysis and we found out that uh, a distance about this high above that bullseye is the best spot you could possibly be uh, for this uh, decommissioning uh, tool rest, right, for where you'd want to take this uh, uh, core. And uh, I'll show you this because the robot is going to keep the core there and it's going to cycle through um, sort of spiraling on this two-dimensional manifold of all the different configurations that are possible to be right there in that uh, 3D location. Right? Remember, we don't care about the orientation. Okay? So that's optimal. Then uh, the next thing that we did uh, for them was to show them why you need to change the commercial control software. So what I'll show you next is I'll tell the robot to go over here and pretend that this is where the nuclear weapon was and that that's where you took the core out and then you started to move towards this location. And I'll show you three different controls. I'll show you the commercial robot controller, what its motion would be if joint one fails. Then I'll show you what would happen if the commercial robot controller was given the information that joint one failed, had the opportunity to recalculate its controls, what it would do. And then I'll show you what our control software does. Okay. So it should be done going through this uh, self-motion fairly quickly here. I've got, um, what, about five minutes left or? Okay. So robots now being told to go to a uh, location over here uh, using the commercial inverse kinematics software. And at this point, we tell it, go back. Uh, and that joint has been simulating a failure. So that joint's not going to move. And that's what the robot does. Not exactly where you want it to go. <laughs> right? To show you that it would have gotten here, we're going to now fix this joint and have it move just along that joint. And you'll see that it would have gotten there if that first joint hadn't failed. So only one out of five joints failed, and you actually had motion backwards. Right? So you say, okay, that may be unfair. We didn't tell the robot that joint one had failed. So let's tell the robot joint one failed. Let it recalculate the motion for the other four joints to get back to that bullseye. So that's what you see next. Uh, we told it joint one failed, recalculate the other four joints, and it gets better. It doesn't go backwards. Uh, it tries to get to the goal. It gets closer, gets closer, but never gets there because it's hit all the limits. It can't go any further. Okay, what's the answer? The answer to this problem. There is an answer to the problem. The problem is you can't deal with the failure after it's occurred. You have to anticipate that a failure occurs. So our software would have put the robot over here in a different configuration. And now when joint one fails, Right? The remaining joints are able to get you back to where you want it to be. So this traditional control paradigm that you have in the fault tolerant business of detect the fail that a failure has occurred, identify that a failure has occurred, and then recover doesn't work. You have to anticipate that a failure occur has occurred at every time that you're moving, right? so that you're in the right configuration. And so we've developed software that allows you to sort of do this, map out the workspaces for how to uh, uh, sort of restrain the joints to be within certain ranges. Uh, this is your original workspace. This is where you can go if joint one fails, joint two fails, joint three fails. And this is the guaranteed region where you can get to those locations regardless of which joint fails. Um, the next part of this, which maybe I can get to very quickly, is that motion is, that work is for point-to-point -point tasks. I need to go here and grab something, and I need to put it here. I don't really care about the trajectory. What happens if you need to move on a particular trajectory? What if I'm arc welding a seam or spray coating a particular line, and I need to maintain a velocity through, the whole, through that whole line? What happens if something fails? Right? The way to do this is think again about the fact that uh, the uh, velocity that you get at the tool tip is the sum of each of the joints. If a joint fails, that's like saying you put zeros here or you eliminate that column. So we can do the analysis we did before. Take all possible Jacobians that you might have with a single joint failure. 
right, striking out each of these columns. Look at all of them using singular value decomposition. Look at the minimum singular value out of all of those. Take the minimum of that. So worst case failure, and it's in the direction, the worst case direction of motion. So that's our measure of fault tolerance at a velocity level as you're moving. Now try to maximize that. You can do that both for control and design. So you can design robots based on optimizing that parameter. And this is uh, interesting because there's analogies between this and error correcting codes. So if you're familiar with error correcting codes, you add bits that, that sort of cover certain regions of the bits you're transmitting, and you want to make sure that you can, t you can cover all of them. Uh, this is the mechanical analogy of this. So if you have three joints that can give you motion at a particular point, right, you don't sort of duplicate them. You don't have two going in X and two going in Y. What you do is you sort of equally distribute them in space, and now you take away any one of them, the other two can add up to re recover it. Right? And this is this example. So this is a, oops. This is a uh, Puma robot, again, for, done for Sandia National Labs. The idea is we're going to simulate uh, that this robot is a, an arc welding robot. That's an arc welder here. We want it to weld the seam at the top of this box. So it's supposed to go to here, go to all of these, and then come back to the top. What you're seeing it do now is that same self-motion uh, where it's trying to just um, go through all of the motions and it's going into an optimal configuration for doing this. Right? First time through, all of the joints are going to work. So it's going to weld these things, every joint, this one, this one, this one, this one, and this one, all five of them. You'll see that all five of them will be working and you need all five of them to weld that seam. Then there'll be five other cases that you'll see and we'll fail each one independently. We'll fail a joint, show you that you can still do the motion. Right, so here's the, uh, fail, without any failures, all the joints are working. Now, you'll, you will not rotate around this waist. Right, that joint has failed. Now we fix this joint and we fail this one. So this joint here will, won't change as you're moving. Then we fix this one and we lock the elbow. So this elbow angle is not changing as you're moving. Now this joint will fail. And then finally this joint will fail right there. Okay. And so again you might say, well that's not fair, right? You're stopping at the, when, at the end, and that's where you're failing things. I want to see what happens if it fails while you're doing the trajectory. Okay? That's what's happening right now. <laughs> so it's moving. Random joints are actually being locked, right? and then started up again, and some other random joint is being locked, and I don't even know uh, what the case is. So it's in a configuration where even though you lose the partial, uh, joint the partial tool tip velocity from one joint, Everything sort of covers for it. As soon as that one goes down, the other four joints ramp up a little bit to recover that velocity. Okay. So um, I should probably wrap up. So I won't show you the uh, free swinging joint failure stuff. But very quickly, uh, takeaway messages. So for failure tolerant control schemes, key message, anticipate worst case failures. Do not get into this paradigm of Failure uh, detection, failure identification, then failure recovery. All right? Anticipate. Have your configuration of the robot always be in an optimal uh, case for failures. Uh, the failure, if it's a locking joint failure, then you want to have no joint be critical. Every joint should be able to be a linear combination of the other joints so that you can recover the motion. In free swinging failures, if, if it's not locked, if the arm just drops due to a failure, you want to minimize some uh, motion, whether it's the swing angle or the swept volume that you'll go through so you minimize uh, um, uh, 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 obstacle collisions. And then takeaways for the entire talk. Uh, if we're going to build robots with the same level of dexterity as humans, right, that can replace humans in operations, uh, at a minimum, we have to give them the kinematic uh, 
complexity that we have. Right? We, you need a lot of other things, right? the sensing and the intelligence, but without the kinematic complexity, they will never be able to do the things that we do. Um, kinematic redundancy, by definition, implies choices. Right? You have extra things to do. Bad choices will actually make things worse. Right? You have to make the right choices with your redundancy. And then finally, it is possible to do fault-tolerant design and control with a limited amount of redundancy. And that's it. So thank you very much.